uh, were most of your flights solo? Uh, we were solo in the airplane, but there were maybe uh, three, four airplanes that went together. We were a flight of, of four or a flight of three, and they all went to the same place. How did you navigate? Uh, we navigated with the VFR chart, of which we're in an open cockpit now, and we had to manage to carry the chart, uh, kind of sit on it, except when we were really navigating, uh, but we did it VFR. If you held that chart out there too far, it'd go right out the cockpit, wouldn't it? It would go right out the cockpit. Sometimes it was very cold. We did a lot of wintertime flying, taking the airplanes up like I said, to Winnipeg or up uh, north. And when you'd get to your destination, they, you would stop, and you, we would have fur-lined suits on. But to get them and get crawl out of the airplane, sometimes you almost had to have the line personnel give you a helping hand, and they were surprised to see it was a woman once they got out of the airplane and took the helmet off. They had hair. <laughs> did you ever, uh, as a wasp, did uh, how did the men treat you, uh, the men pilots especially, when, when these women come flying in in these airplanes? Um, they were shocked. And uh, actually, I, I thought we were treated fairly well. Occasionally, someone would be disgruntled over something, or maybe uh, they didn't understand we were there for a real purpose. But they knew that they, if we came in there, for every one of us that came in, one of them was going to be shipped overseas. So I think this is where they got disgruntled. Tell us about one particular uh, trip that really stands out in your mind, a cross-country trip as a wasp that uh, you'd like to share with us? Christmas time, where I, we came out of Hagerstown. We're on our way, way to Canada. And the weather, we got as far as Fort Wayne, and the weather was bad ahead, but the flight leader and most of us was pretty conscientious, but I wanted to stay in Fort Wayne, and we had to be out of Fort Wayne within 15 minutes, or we couldn't make it on into South Bend before sundown, and the weather came in, and uh, the airplanes are hand-cranked from the outside. Three of the airplanes started, and the fourth one didn't. My airplane started, but the one airplane didn't. And, uh, and Joe McCormick, who was a friend of mine, every time it started up, she would pull the primer out, and it would die down. And of course, the sergeant outside cranking knew about it. The flight leader came over, and she was going to start it, and so he pulled the primer on the outside, and I got home for Christmas. I've never been away from home for Christmas. And here you are, a young lady, you've been flying all kinds of airplanes all over the country, and in a year and a half you find yourself coming back to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, some ladies uh, dreamed of being a, a mother and a housewife, but you had that drive to continue flying. Uh, pick up the story there, Margaret. Well, I came back and went back out to Pierce Flying Service where I had learned to fly, and... Um, Three months later, I got my flight instructor's license, and then I was going to instruct. But who wants to ride with a girl pilot? Girls can't be pilots. And it, I had to just be patient. Besides that, there was a male instructor there, and he needed to help support his family. And uh, so I had to be patient, and it's paid off. And eventually those, uh, those students come. The students come one by one, and I got to do a lot of instructing. And uh, eventually you started flying charter and, and some corporate work? I, start, I got into corporate work and charter work, and eventually kind of retired from the flight schools, and I'm still riding with my students that are still have their airplanes, and I'm, I'm still flying. Tell us a little bit about uh, the Powder Puff Derby and how you got interested in racing airplanes. Uh, the Powder Puff Derby came through Fort Wayne one day, and uh, uh, I volunteered to help direct the girls in and do whatever I could, and people along the fence said, why aren't you racing? Why are you just working here? I guess the seed was planted, 
and the next year I started racing. Well, the powder puff, meaning women racing. And now it's not always the airplane that arrives first that wins. Tell us how, how a powder puff derby works. Uh, most all races, like the race I'm preparing for now, London to Sydney, the airplanes are actually handicapped according to their horsepower and their speed. And it's a person that does the most over that handicap is the one that wins the race. It is not a speed. It is not a side-by-side, -side, something unsafe. It's a very safe thing to do. Preparing for the race in June, I have started on that now. In other words, I'm looking at handicaps. I'm looking at different makes airplanes to see which one has the better handicap, what kind of weather they'll be on the route when we go out there, and then preparing the airplane, making sure the plugs and the engine and everything Prop is in good condition, um, waxing the airplane, having it clean. Uh, Margaret, some of your strategies, your find and winds aloft. Do you have a special weatherman or a weather service that you particularly use, somebody that you really, really knows that you're racing and you need the edge? Oh, yes. I use a, a professional weather service because they can set and watch the weather and study the weather to see if I should uh, stay on the ground and maybe leave in the afternoon. Where When you call on the phone, that's very difficult now. and We do not have weather stations along the way to do it with. Uh, I know uh, in your book you mentioned one race. Uh, you uh, were really surprised. You were looking for some tailwinds, and you kept going higher. Tell us about that. Well, I was flying solo that year, and uh, my weatherman had <clears throat> prescribed an altitude, the best altitude for the airplane. Didn't think it would pay for me to go much higher because the horsepower backs off at that time. But every time I rose up another 500 feet or 1,000, I picked up speed, so I kept going until I went up to about 13,000, and I think I was in the bottom part of the jet stream. <laughs> your round-the-world trip. How did it begin? Uh, I had a doctor that had flown some races well, over in Illinois and some of the smaller races I'd been in, and he called the house, and of course my first reaction is, Doc, you know how old I am. Uh, this is in 94. And uh, he said, well, why? What's your pro problem? And I said, oh, just too many years. And he said, Oh, that's no problem. And, I, and then I said, well, I can't afford anything like this. And he said he'd pay for everything uh, except my room and board because he wasn't looking for a girlfriend. He was looking for a pilot. And uh, that's the way my, the invitation came. And pretty soon before you know it, you're on a around-the-world trip? I'm on an around-the-world trip, but this doctor had a stroke and couldn't go, and uh, I called Paris to withdraw. And when I, they had two girls from Canada that their pilot had dropped out. So uh, I called them, and they went with me around the world. So there were three girls of us went.